break every chain, 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 break every chain. There's an army rising up. There's an Break every chain, break every chain. There is healing in the name of Jesus. Claim it, claim it. There is healing in the name of Jesus. There is healing in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. God, we just pray right now, Father, that you would break every chain of addiction. We break you chain, break every chain, Lord, of, of bad attitudes, Lord, in the name of Jesus. That you would break every chain of sin in the name of Jesus. God, we ask you in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would loose forth the power of healing, the power of deliverance, God, the power of salvation over your people, God, in this church, in this city, God, over marriages, over families, in the name of Jesus, in homes, God. We lose the salvation. We lose healing. We lose deliverance, God. We lose joy in the name of Jesus. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Think about maybe somebody right now that you know is under the power of some type of, uh, of addiction, maybe under the power of some type of uh, character flaw or something that's been done to them and they just can't seem to get out. They're trying. They want to live differently. They want to they wanna do things differently, but they're, they're under the control of something right now. They need right now your prayer. Will you go up before God right now and say, God, deliver them, set them free? If you want to ask somebody to pray with you, say, I've got a family member right now that needs deliverance. Will you stand in agreement in prayer with me? Will you pray that God will set them free from alcohol, from drug addiction, from sexual addiction, from some kind of a behavioral addiction in the name of Jesus? God, set them free, Lord. You're the God who gives freedom. God, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. That's the power we have in you, Jesus. That's the power we have, Jesus. Break it, God. Break it, God. Break it over my Uncle Jack. Break it, God, over my family in Jesus' name. Lord, we want to be free, God.
Jesus. We love you so much, God. We love you, Lord. Thank you for saving us, God. Thank you for washing us clean, Lord. We didn't deserve it. Nobody in this room, Lord, deserves it whatsoever, Lord. Without you, God, we would be nothing, God. Every single person, Lord, if it wasn't for your love and your mercy on upon us, God, we would be nothing. Oh, God, thank you for saving us and giving us a new life, giving us purpose, God, giving us hope, God. We love you so much, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. Amen. So uh, we'll go ahead. Let's pray for our young people tonight as they get ready to be dismissed. Father, Lord, we pray for our teens, for our children. God, we pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would uh, bless them. Some are, have gone back to school. Some are getting ready to go back to school. God, we pray, Lord, for them, Jesus, that as they go back to school, that your protection will be upon them, that you would uh, give them a better second half than even a first half, that they would finish the year strong, Lord, that they would learn everything they need to learn, that, God, you would deliver them from anything or anyone that would try to pull them down or pull them away from you. And, God, you would put people in their life, Lord, that would push them closer to you. And, Lord, you would use the light that is in their life, Lord, to lead others to the knowledge of you, to yours, towards your love and salvation. God, and be in their homes, Lord. I pray that you would be with their parents, be with Lord, uh, with their siblings, God, and bless them, God. Let there be joy and peace and love in their homes. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Gabriel, and what is, what is your name? I'm sorry. 2023. Yes. Uh, Gabriel and Shaughnessy are visiting with us tonight. So. Welcome. <laughs> welcome to stay over there. You're welcome to come to this side. Hey, Gabriel. It's good to see you. It'll be a little different tonight. Um, Pastor and I had a talk yesterday. We're kind of shifting gears. 
So I'm going to try to finish up with Psalms Always Tonight and lead into what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. So um, I don't have, um, I have a Bible today that I have. Um, but um, I believe Pastor announced on Sunday that, you know, the church is entering a season of prayer. Um, so um, I'm going to kind of end leading into that and try to tie that into what we'll be talking about the next three weeks. I think that prayer is, um, it's not optional in the life of a believer. It should be a non-questionable. Yes. It should be something that we don't even have to think about when I'm going to do it. It should be something that we miss it if we don't do it. And that's where we need to get because, unfortunately, in the church in America, too many of us can go days, dare say weeks, maybe months, without getting alone with him and, and really experiencing his presence outside of the four walls of the church. It's easy to come inside the four walls of the church and feel his presence. It's a different thing to find that time and make that time and be intentional about it in your, you know, your daily life. But that should be a non-negotiable because Jesus did it every day. And if we're going to be like him, we have to do the things that he did, right? So that's what pastor's calling us into um, um, a 21 day of, 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 you know, calling us into a time of prayer. Um, and um, But I want to finish up the Song of Solomon. I know that if I don't, um, I won't get back to it. Um, so I'm going to go to chapter 5. Um, and remind me at the end to let's have prayer for Damon Hamlin. I'm just going to say that now. We look at it; it's tragic. Yeah. But do you know God will use a football player to bring the, the people to their knees? Yeah. Because I didn't watch the clip, but there was some news broadcaster, um, and he said something about praying for him. But he just stopped his broadcast and he just prayed on air for Damar Hamlin, right? And you don't see, you know, God is calling people. You see people on, you know, and ESPN is not God friendly, right? Right? They're owned by Disney. They're not God friendly any longer. But you know, their commentators were calling people to pray. You know, sending prayers his way. That we weren't sending good vibes, right? People are hungry. People know that good vibes don't work, right? America, the people around us are hungry for something that's real, that an answer that's going to work, because what we've done the last few years has done nothing but brought a lot of destruction and a lot of turmoil, a lot of anxiety. So at the end, I want to spend time and pray for that man, because I believe that God can do a miracle in his life, yes. and that it will be all done to his glory. Right. Yep. Amen? Yes. Amen? So, um, Song of Solomon, chapter 5. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'll read a little bit of it, but I'm just going to talk about what's happening here, right? So this story is the story of a maturing love, right? Someone who's maturing in her love for the bride or for the queen, right? And she's come to that place. She's gone through the difficult times. She's gone to the place where it was all about her, and now she's recognizing that she brings joy to the king, right? And um, we're just going to call that a right and, and she's now the king looks at her as his spouse his bride right she's maturing into this place where she realizes that the king finds pleasure in her right that she has something to offer the king and it's not just about what she can gain from the king and, and we talked about in chapter two when he called her away and she just she just didn't she didn't have the courage to go she was she was not trusting his love enough to go to the mountain with him right and um then he comes back and he affirms her, and she finally says, you know what, I'll go away with you. I realize that where you're at is the safest place for me to be in. And that's one thing that I believe that we need to realize is that wherever he is at is the best place for you to be. It doesn't matter if it's in the middle of a storm. It doesn't matter if it's on the beach. It doesn't matter what's going on, if it's the most tumultuous thing you've ever been in. If Christ is with you, it's where you need to be. I'd rather be in the darkest, stormiest sea with him than in the calm by myself. 
right? Wherever he is, is where I need to be. And that's the place where she's realized that she needs to be with him. And um, so in, in chapter two, she just kind of said, no, you go away, I'm not ready. And then he comes in and she, he starts affirming her and she says, you know what, you are what I need. And then in chapter five, he, he takes her to this, to this what, what many people refer to as the dark night of the soul because it says he comes knocking on the door again. And she says, but, you know, I, I've already changed out of my clothes and I've, I've taken off my, my clothes and I have my robe on and I've, I've washed my feet and I'm ready for bed. Do I really want to go with you, right? I mean, she's just like, he's knocking. And two chapters ago, what would she have said? You go. But she gets herself out of bed and she goes and she says, I open the door, but he's gone. Left. This wasn't disobedience. She didn't tell him to go. But he left. And what does this tell me? That tells me there are times when I'm seeking him, there's times when I'm comfortable in him. He is going to remove the sense of his presence from my life. Anybody ever been there when God's been silent? Everybody ever been there when you didn't hear from him and you were doing everything that you knew to do, but it felt like your prayers were hitting off of a rubber wall, right? And there are those times, and can I tell you, I, you know, Pastor said, I don't know how you're going to link prayer into this, but can I tell you, time spent in the secret place is what gets you through those moments when he, his presence is no longer tangible in your life. Because he didn't leave her, Right? Because it, it says he's Emmanuel, God with us, right? He's promised to never leave us nor forsake us, right? He is everywhere at all times. So it's not a matter that he wasn't with her, but he did withdraw his presence from her, right? And she said, where do you go? And what does she do? She, she starts seeking him. And, 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 it, and later on in that chapter, it says, tell, if you see him, tell him I'm lovesick for him. What a change from two chapters ago, right? He was the one that was lovesick for her. And now she's saying, if you find the one I love, would you tell him my heart is sick for him? I need him. I love him and I need his presence in my life. And can I tell you, that's the place that we need to be. In our, in our relationship with him, that if we don't have his presence in our lives, then would so many of us give up. When difficulties come, and when we don't sense his presence, or when it feels like our prayers aren't getting through, so often the easy thing to do is quit. It's to give up, and it's to go looking for answers in any other place, right? How many of you aren't very patient? Right? We've already talked about this. How many of us, if the answer doesn't come the way we think it should, when it should, we're going to go figure it out and do it our own. Anybody? Has it ended well for you? It never ends well, right? It never ends well when we try to do things our way. And that's what she's realizing is I need, I need the king. I need the love of the king. I need to be, I need to be with him. I need to feel his presence. And the story goes on, and I'm rushing through this just so I can get through it. We may come back and revisit it later. But she finds the king, and he starts to reaffirm her again, and she declares her love for him. And in verse 6, she realizes it. She said, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Those are probably some of the sweetest words ever written in Scripture, right? She realizes who she belongs to, and she realizes who belongs to her. Now, if you've ever been loved and you've ever been chosen, is there any greater feeling, right? Is there any greater feeling than for someone to say, you're the one, you're the only one for me, right? And when someone says you're not the only one, there's nothing more heartbreaking than for someone to say, well, there's someone else, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? There's something about being chosen and to know that you are the one for that one. And that's what she realizes now. I am my beloved. He loves me. When I'm going through difficulty, when I don't feel him, I still know that he loves me. When the dark night of my soul, when my soul is, is lost and dark and in turmoil, I know that he loves me and I know that I'm safe because he loves me. 
And I know that whatever I'm going through, I know it's going to be all right because he loves me. I belong to the beloved and he belongs to me, right? He is always mine as long as I want him to be, right? And that's the place that she's at is he is, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. And then in chapter eight, it ends with this. Set me as a seal upon your heart. There's some controversy, not controversy, but debate whether this is the bridegroom speaking or the Shulamite. Uh, my Bible says it's the Shulamite speaking. And, and I, I, I like to think it's the Shulamite because this is her final declaration. She said, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would utterly be despised. So, you, so, so right, this is mature love, right? This is what she's saying now. Set your love as a seal, right? What is, what is a seal? What does a seal do, right? If you seal something, right? What are you, what are you doing when you seal something? Locks it in. You're, you're, you're locking it in? Remember like when, um, back in the day, the king would have a ring, and he, what, he would, what would he do? They would melt wax, and he would take his ring, and he would seal that, right, with his, meaning it was his, it was locked in, it was done, right? And that's what she's saying. She has come full circle. She has come from a person that, that couldn't accept his love and didn't know how to love to a person that says, you know what, I am fully yours, you are fully mine, and would you seal your love? Right? Would you set your love as a reminder, right? On my heart, on my arm, as a reminder that I belong to you and that you belong to me. Right? And as and, and for law for love is as strong as death, jealousy is cruel. What she's saying here, I'm willing to die for you. And if I asked all of us in this room, are you willing to die for him? I'm not even certain, right, that I could raise my hand without hesitation. Do you understand what I'm saying? I always go back to that one school shooting um, where that one young girl, right? They asked her to denounce Christ and she wouldn't and they put a bullet in her, right? Because she was not going to denounce Christ. Man, I would like to think that that's me. I really would, but if I'm honest, I'm not sure that that's me. Do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, if I'm honest, I'd like to do the religious thing and say, oh yes, I'll die for you. But I've said it before, let's be honest, we can't even live for him, right? We can't even sacrifice time, can't sacrifice sleep, right? We can't sacrifice pleasure to spend time with him. Do I think I would really take a bullet for him? I don't know. I mean, I mean I'm thinking for me, no, maybe you would. I'm not so certain that I would. Uh, but that's what she's saying. Love is as strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. And its flames are flames of fire, and most vehement flame, and many waters cannot quench love. What she's saying here, my love is undeniable. Nothing can take away my love from you. It doesn't matter where I go. It doesn't matter what where life takes me. It doesn't matter what trials I go through. I'm reminded of a verse in, in Isaiah 40, I believe it is, says that when you go through the fire, you'll not be you'll, you'll not be harmed. You can go through the flood, and the floods won't overtake you. And that's what he's saying. It doesn't matter wherever you take me, wherever you lead me, I'm going to follow you and I'm going to know that I'm safe with you. And if you call me to die for you, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Right? And we see that in the New Testament church because many of the disciples were martyred. Right? Many of the 12 that, that, that were um, called with Jesus after he ascended, many of them gave their lives for the gospel. And that's what she's saying here. Many waters cannot quench nor can the floods drown it. And if a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, right? They're saying that your love is immeasurable. There is nothing, there is no price to your love. I could sell everything I have and it still wouldn't be enough. No, no amount of money in the world is worth the love that you have for me. That's a pretty amazing revelation to come that it's not found in things, it's not found in the acceptance of people, it's not found in the approval of man, but it's just knowing that I am my beloved's and he is mine, right? 
And when you when you know that, it's a game changer. It changes the way you live. It changes the way you think. It changes everything that you do. It makes you want to spend time in the secret place. It makes you want to spend time growing closer to him. And that's really what it's all about, is becoming that person that knows that you belong to him and that he belongs to you. Man, we gotta get that in our spirit. He belongs to me, he's mine. And I belong to him, right? The word says that nothing can take me out of his hands, right? The word says that no, no, no one can pluck you, I think is what the scripture is, right? Out of, the, out of his hand, he's got you, you belong to him. As long as, you, as long as you will allow him to hold you and protect you and to stay hidden in him, he's got you. And he's with you through it all. Um, any questions? I sped through that, and I know I did. Any thoughts, any comments, any questions on the Shiva life? It's a great story. Um, it is, to me, this is what the scripture is all about. This is what we got to give how to fall in love with Jesus, how to love him, right? How to love him and how to accept his love for us. Because some of us have a hard time with accepting his love, right? Some of us have a hard time because we don't feel worthy, right? Remember that? I'm dark, but I'm lovely, right? Some of us have a hard time understanding and recognizing and receiving the fact that he loves me unconditionally, right? He loves us unconditionally, and that's an amazing place to be. Um, any, any thoughts, any questions? I'm going to transition if there's nothing else. Go with me to um, Genesis. The 50th chapter. Talking about, we're going to start talking a little bit about prayer. And it's, I was um, reading this morning. This was my devotion. And um, I want to want to talk going on that last thought about some of us have a hard time accepting love. And I want to talk about forgiveness tonight. Because I believe that that's one of those things in our lives that God can only heal in the secret place. And I believe that forgiveness is hard to receive and forgiveness is hard to give. Anybody? Anybody have a hard time giving forgiveness? Anybody have a hard time receiving forgiveness? Right? Anybody think that maybe you've forgiven and you realize that you really haven't? Right? Forgiveness is hard. And you know what comes out of unforgiveness? You know what, what rises up in you? I'm sorry? Resentment. Resentment, yep. What else? Bitterness. Bitterness. Yeah. Right? And I believe that this is something that we all deal with. And I, I it, it, it's, it's something that I believe that God wanted us to hear today. Um, and I'm going to go to chapter... 50 in the book of Genesis. Um, I think it's chapter 50. Um, let me find it. Yep. Verse 16. I read it in another Bible. I'm like, that doesn't look right. But I did it, read it in another Bible. Um, so Joseph's father died, right? So this is at the end of Genesis. This is the end of Joseph's life. Exodus starts the Moses chapter, right? The, the, the era of Moses. We all know the story of Genesis, but if not, I will, we'll recap a little bit. Je Joseph was the son of Jacob, right? Um, he was Jacob's favorite son, right? Um, 
Not that we're supposed to have favorites, but Jacob didn't make any bones about it, or yeah, Joseph was his favorite. And God anointed Jacob as a young child, and he would give him dreams, and he would give him visions of how he was going to elevate him to places of power. And Joseph, you know, sometimes people give him a hard rap, you know, for saying his dream. Um, you know, but maybe they were just jealous. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's the way he told it. I don't know. Um, but his brothers didn't like the fact that the 11 of them bowed down to him. And, um, right? Yeah. And uh, so so they, they were very jealous because Jacob made him a coat of many colors, right? And they nobody he didn't make any of them, up, any of the other ones, a coat. But he made Joseph a coat. And they were jealous. And, and they just, they really couldn't deal with Joseph. So one day he was out and he was telling him a dream and um, maybe he was being a little cocky or whatever, um, but they didn't like it. So they took the coat off of him. They threw him in a pit. They dipped his coat in animal blood and they took the coat back to the dad and said, hey, you know what? We don't know what happened to Joseph, but here's his bloody coat. Something happened to him and Jacob thought Joseph was wrong. And so they sold Joseph into slavery and he goes into Egypt but God had a call in his life and we talk about you know how does this tie in I, I as I'm saying this it's like Joseph knew his God right Joseph knew that it was better to be in Egyptian slavery with his God than to be in the house of his father without his God you understand what I'm saying here right he ends up in, in, in um, slavery and and the story, you know, you can read it, and over and over, I think it's three or four times if you go and read the story of Joseph, I'm not gonna point it out here, but read it and find it, it says the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. Every time something bad happened to him, the yeah. Lord was with Joseph, Yeah. right? He, he got accused yeah. of, um, of trying to rape Potiphar's wife, and it was a false accusation, and he gets thrown in prison, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph. And when he's in Joseph, he. God gives him some dreams and he goes and he gets elevated, he gets taken out of prison, he gets taken and put in Pharaoh's, um, in the government. And he is elevated to the second in command of Egypt, right? So he's this person of power. The dreams that God had given him came true. He had to go through difficulty to get there. And I'm wondering if we were Joseph, how many of us would have had the, had the faith to just wait it out. How many of us would have just had the faith to trust in the dream that God has given us? Because I can tell you that God's probably given us dreams that maybe we've given up on. But don't give up with the dream because God is with you, right? God, the Lord was with Joseph, right? Just because there's a delay doesn't mean there's a no, right? Mm -hmm. Just because there's a silence doesn't mean that he's not with you. Right? Just because you open the door and he's not there doesn't mean that he's still not working something out for your good. Right? The Lord was with Joseph, so he's second in command. And then what happens? He's in charge. Joseph is in charge of, of food, right? So he, he's, he's taking all the, the, the tithe and you know the food that people are bringing into the storehouse. And, and a famine hits, right? So Joseph was a wise person. He saved. There's a there's a financial principle in that, right? Saving for famine, right? Because Joseph had, he said they had silos and grain stored up. And Joseph was able to feed all of Egypt. And his brothers found out that there was food in Egypt. So they come to Egypt looking for food. And, you know, he's got the, the Egyptian garb on. So they can't see that it's Joseph, but Joseph can see that it's his brothers. And what was Joseph's reaction when he saw his brothers? If anybody had a reason to be unforgiven, it was Joseph. But what's his response to them? It's in chapter 49. Or maybe, no, it's not. It's, um, it might be in 47. But his very first response to them um, is it's okay. You don't have to, when he finally reveals 
himself to them, right? Right. If you're the brothers, what are you thinking? We've had it. <laughs> right. If you're the if you're one of the right, Benjamin wasn't here, so there's ten of them. And if you're the ten of them, and he takes off that mask and he's standing in front of you, what are you thinking? <laughs> Game over. <laughs> We're not getting any food. Right? Imagine their shock when he looks at him and says, "You know, it's okay. God had His hand on everything that you did for me." Man, how many of us can say when something bad happens? that God had his hand in that. And I was praying today and I'm like, God, give me the willingness to suffer so that someone can know you. Right? Because we don't want to suffer. We don't want to have to go through difficulty. Right? We want it to be all, you know, roses without the thorns. And I pray, God, give me a heart to be willing to go through difficulty so someone else can be saved, so someone else's need can be met, right? Because that's what Joseph said to them. It's okay. I am here, and I'm able. He literally saved the nation. He saved the whole people group because he was strong and peaceful. Do you get that? Do you think that that's what he was thinking? Or maybe Joseph was thinking that. But would we have been thinking that? He saved the whole people because he was put in charge and his wisdom. He saved grain. And for seven years there was famine in the land. And he was able to save his family. And he comes to his brothers and he says, don't worry about it. God was in it. I'm in the place I am. And, I, and God worked his will through, your, through what you did to me. And it's okay. Just go back and tell my father that I'm alive. Would you do that? And, and bring, I want to see Benjamin, right? It's a done deal for Joseph. So the brothers go back, and they get Benjamin, and they come back, right? And Jacob's with them. Um, and in verse 16, or verse 15, it's after Jacob died, right? So Jacob's given the blessings to all the kids, right? So J Jacob's last thing was to give the blessings to the 12 sons. So he's gone. He's blessed them, and they come back in verse 15 in chapter 50. And it says, when bro uh, Joseph's brothers saw their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to them. Do you see what's happening here? Who has a hard time accepting forgiveness? Who has a hard time accepting Joseph told him, it's okay. It's all good. They know they deserved bad. something. Hmm? They know they deserved the, the bad. They know they deserved it, but Joseph said it's, it's done. No need to worry. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, before your father died, he commanded. Right? So this is, the brothers are passing. The scripture doesn't say this, but this was a blessing that Jacob gave to the 10 or the 11. Joseph wasn't there. And the brothers are relaying this to Joseph. And in verse 17, it says, Thus you shall, say, you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. <coughs> and that's the end of what Jacob said. And it says, Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father, and Joseph wept when they spoke to him. It had already been forgiven. So he says, will you forgive? And Joseph, what does Joseph do? He's already forgiven. And do you know that forgive is the first time in Scripture where you see the word forgive? Nowhere else in Scripture before that point do you see the word forgive. And there, that's the lesson. Joseph is a type of Christ, right? He's talking about forgiveness. He forgave, honestly, that's something unforgivable. I'm telling you, you sell me into, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be happy. You treat me like that? You let my mom think I'm dead and not, and not and keep that from her? I'm not going to take kindly to that, right? 
but he looks at him and, and, and that's astonishing to me that he's, they say, well, you, your, your dad said you have to do this. And what does he say in verse 18? And his brothers also went and fell down before his face and they said, behold, we are your servants. We never asked for anything from them, right? But they're saying, we're not worthy, right? They didn't feel worthy. We'll be, we'll be your servants. Just don't, just don't. Just don't take vengeance on us now that they ask us, right? We'll be your servants. And Joseph says again, Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. I think I said it kind of wrong, I'm sorry. For am I in the place of God? For am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Yeah. In order to bring it about yeah. as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and he spoke kindly to them. Go ahead. Do you think they thought at that time that they remembered the dream? Or were they? Oh, I'm sure they remembered the dream. I'm sure they. Absolutely. I'm sure they remembered the dream. Um, but, you know, it, it sticks out to me. How forgiveness was given, but it wasn't received. And I'm telling you, we got to be able to accept the forgiveness of the Father. Because if you come to Him sincerely asking for forgiveness, do you know it says He cast your sin as far as the east? From the west. Is from the west, right? Mm -hmm. We've said this before. There's a north pole and there's a south pole, but there's not an east pole and there's not a west pole. It doesn't end. He'll never catch up with it. It's infinite, right? And when you come to him with sincere heart and true repentance, not just some kind of mumbo-jumbo prayer, right, where there's no repentance, right? There has to be true repentance. We don't talk about repentance anymore. But that's what he's looking for, the posture of your heart. Right? And when you come to him with a sincere heart, he forgives you. He forgets about it. But you know who doesn't forget about it? Us. Who else? Absolutely. Which is why spending time in the secret place is oh so important. Right? Because that's where your mind is transformed. That's where you are transformed into the image of God. Right? If you get up every day and you don't go in, right? I mean, we know this in the physical. Like a couple of weeks ago when it was 30 below wind chill, if I went outside, in my pajamas, and I stayed outside and spent my, what would happen to me? Frostbite. Frostbite? How long would I survive? Not long. Not long. <laughs> right? Like, no offense, especially you. I, I, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, even, I wouldn't even melt oh, snow, right? heavier your pajamas. <laughs> especially in my pajamas, right? I'm not lasting long. If I get up and I don't go in the kitchen and get food, how long am I going to live? Especially me. Rick, Rick, I'm saying you probably got a few more days than me. You're, you're always cold anyway. I'm always cold anyway, right? How long am I going to live if I don't eat? Maybe 10, 12 days. Maybe. 12 days, 10, eight, I'm going to go with you. You're better than my husband. I'm going with 12. I'm not going to live very long, right? I'm just, it's not going to happen. So I know that every day, especially for me, I got to eat, I got to hydrate, got to exercise, right? I'm at a cardiac risk because of my health, so I know I got to exercise. I know that when it's cold outside, like 60, I need to put coat on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, 
I wear a coat at 60. We were out the other day, and I'm like, it's cold. He's like, it's 60. I'm like, all right, it's cold. I mean, I'm good like 85. Then it starts yeah, to get like, yeah, yeah right? 85 yeah. is like, I shed the coat, right? Um, the problem was it wasn't 66. Yeah, that's fine. Right. <laughs> so, so I know that I have to do those things in the natural if I'm going to live. And I'm not going to harm myself, right? But yet, I've been guilty of getting up and starting my day without eating now. Without putting on the mind of Christ. Without clothing myself in his righteousness. Right? Anybody else been guilty? Right? And I go out and I fight an enemy without my protection? Who's going to win? Not me. Hypothermia set in my day. Right? I'm not going to win. And that's why the secret place, and I'm telling you, that's why Pastor is calling us to this time of prayer to help us understand the importance of it because I promise you it makes all the difference in the world and it should be a non-negotiable it, 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 you know 90% of the days what's, what's 90% of 365 36 330 some days you should be spending time in it 100% but I realize there's times that you know you're not going to be able to spend like you normally would. But it's a non-negotiable. We control our day. We control our time. That's the one thing that we can control. We have since so I say 27 hours. We have 24 hours in a day. I control those. Right? My employer gets eight to four thirty, but I do get an hour lunch and two 15 minute breaks. I got an hour and a half in the day. I control those hours. How do I, how well do I control that, right? I get off work at 4.30, so I have 4.30 till 8 o'clock the next morning. I have to sleep some. I control those hours, right? I'm 56 years old. Nobody gets to tell me what I do with my hours, right? I control those hours. So it's, it's not a time problem, it's a priority problem. Right? And that's what he's calling us to is this place because I'm telling you if you don't spend time with that and you find yourself in a Joseph situation you're not going to rise to number two in the kingdom. And you're not going to be saving lives. And um, receiving the forgiveness. In John 15 and 15 and I'm closing because I think I'm waiting. i got four minutes. I am no longer calling you servants. Understand, remember the brother said, I'll be your servant. Remember? John 15, 15. I am no longer calling you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. Now I have called you friends. This is Jesus speaking. And, and you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to teach this, and I will. I don't know where. But John 13 through 17. They call it the Olivet Discourse. Um, because those are Jesus' last words. After the Last Supper, this is the last words of Jesus to his disciples before he died. I think those are pretty important words, right? Um, you ever heard someone's last dying words, right? And this is what he's saying in chapter 15 of the night before he's betrayed. I am no longer calling you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. Now I have called you friends, because everything I have heard from my father I have made known to you. And these things I command you, so that you may love one another. And can I tell you what? Joseph loved his brothers. That's what he did, is he loved them and he loved them well, right? And how are people going to know that we're the disciple of Jesus if we love them? How do you show love? I think giving forgiveness is one of the best ways that you can show someone you love them. Because it's hard to do. And can I tell you how you show you some, you know, we talk a lot about self-care. Most of it's garbage. But forgiving yourself is the best self-care you'll ever do. You can't go back and undo anything that's happened in the past. But you can forgive yourself. And you can love yourself enough to not hold on to it. And you can love yourself enough to forgive yourself. And you can love yourself enough to forgive others. Because loving others, when you forgive someone else, you set them free, but you set yourself free. 
Can I tell you, there is unforgiveness. Someone said it. It's, it brings resentment. It brings bitterness. It's horrible. And that's the best thing. That's the best gift you can give yourself is the gift of forgiveness. And that's the best gift that you can give someone else is the gift of forgiveness. Because, right, if we're going to be like Christ, what did he come to do? If you confess, huh? That's why he came, right? Why did he forgive our sins? So that we can live at peace with one another. That's scripture. That's why he came. So that we can live at peace. It's important. Forgiveness is important. And you put it in the Lord's Prayer, or the, the model prayer, right? Forgive us our debts as we forgive give those that sin against us, or as we forgive our debtors, right? And so when we go into this time of, of, of prayer, um, I will tell you, um, pastor is asking, he, he wants to do, starting Sunday, he's asking for 12 people. If more want to do it, that's fine. But um, we're asking for 12 people that will commit to a 21-day prayer leading up to the all-night prayer. It will start on Sunday, January 8th. It will end on Saturday, January 28th, whatever that day is, which is the night when our 24-hour, we start a 24-hour prayer night sometime on Saturday, Friday. I'm not sure the time yet. And it'll go through Saturday. The, the prayer will end on that Saturday. Um, and then we have church on Sunday. Pastor is asking for 12 people that will commit to praying and doing some type of fast in 21 days. Because I believe prayer is what changes things. And it takes 21 days to form a habit. I don't want to call it a habit, but it will help you get in to, to make that part of your routine. So, I, you know, you, you, you can pray about it, or you can just say, yeah, that's something. It's, it will change you. Um, and we, we, he'll have guides and, and devotions, and I think that he said that he would do a, like a weekly accountability thing, right? So this isn't something you sign up and never show up to, right? And why 12? Because he changed the world with 12 disciples. Right? You give 12 people that are committed to something, 12 catch fire. The rest will catch fire. So if that's something that you need to pray about or something that you want to think about, I would strongly encourage you, if you want to grow deeper in your relationship with Christ, if you want to grow deeper in intimacy with him, the time of saying I want it is over. Because when you stand before him on judgment day, he doesn't say, well, good thing you thought about it. Well, done. Well, Thinking about it doesn't change anything. Doing something about it changes it. So I, I leave you with that a little harsh, and I apologize, but I believe there's an urgency in the day we're living in. I believe God is calling his church to back to consecration. I go back to Exodus, and I'm done, but nobody else is in here, so I'll keep talking. <laughs> when he was going to meet with Moses on the mountain, he said, tell the people to consecrate themselves. And that meant, for the men, right, that meant no sexual relation because you couldn't be in the presence of God, right? It meant purifying yourself, doing a ritual, right? It meant for three days it was a period of consecration. And he said, and I want to meet with the people, so tell them to consecrate themselves. And I believe that he's calling his church back to a time of consecration and dedication and a recommitment that they're going to live for him. And they're going to do, right? And they're going to grow in their intimacy, right? In their relationship with him. I believe that that's what he wants. He wants that Song of Solomon bride, right? That desires nothing more than him. He wants that Song of Solomon woman that realizes that I am my beloved and he is mine. And, and there's nothing else in my life that is more important than him. I'm not there yet. But I want that to be the place that. That's the place where I want to be. Because where he's at, it's all good. Even when it doesn't look good, it's all good. Right? Any other thoughts? Any Anything um, else? Yes? Uh, you just said something about uh, committing to praying. Like, yep. I didn't really fully understand like um, what I was committing to because we were going from 
So it's just it's just taking time. So, so just saying, you know what, for, for the next 21 days, I'm going to set aside a specific time every day. Um, and that's, I mean, it could be, you know, I don't know your work schedule, right? But I'm going to set aside time every day. And I'm going to read some scripture, and I'm going to spend time talking to God, praying, you know, repenting, asking God to reveal himself to me, listening to him, asking him to speak to me, you know, praying for myself and asking him to help me with any struggles that I'm having in my life, helping him, you know, asking him to help people around me, help, help you know, asking him just to help me be the person, right, that he's called me to be, right? Asking him to do his work in my life and to make my life holy like he is holy. Does that help? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right? So for 21 days, that's what you know, that's what the pastor asked me for 12 people. That's seven, <laughs> but double double 12. Um, you'll be one. All right. Okay. We got two. Uh, there's a sign up sheet. I'll get it from pastor. So I'll need your email address if you have, or your phone number or something. Because uh, he does want to meet. You know, I think that what he had talked about was maybe because um, uh, he does want us to fast at least one meal um, with this. Um, and uh, I think he talked about maybe meeting at the church one night a week during dinner time. So that during our fast, we're, we're, it's accountability, right? What is God speaking to you, right? That, because that's how, right? What, what, because I believe that if you're praying and if you're seeking God, he's going to speak something to you. He, he's going to reveal himself to you. And, and, and there's going to be something that he reveals to you that, that you know, and it might be his truth is truth. And, and I'm not, you know, here's my other my other um, pet peeve, there is only one truth. You don't have your truth. I don't have my truth. There's God's truth. I mean, can we just say it? His truth is the only one that matters. The rest of us just have an opinion, right? We don't have truth. We have an opinion. Um, and if our truth isn't in alignment with his truth, it ain't truth, right? But I do believe that God will reveal truth to different people in different ways and I always look at it this way I manage a team of five people um, so when I have to train something um, it might you know I might have to get creative in the way I teach something a skill right what I how I normally start out they may not grasp the concept that way but I can come up with something to help them grasp the concept right and it might take me three or four attempts but I'll figure out a way to help them understand that's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. He might speak to you the same truth in another way and speak it to someone else. And it's all his truth, but he just reveals it in different ways, right? So, Pastor, um, I, I apologize. I don't remember your name. They want to do the 21 day of prayer and fasting. So I told them you had the list. Um, so, um, so anyway, I think, I think we're done now. Pastor showed up, so.